Attosecond physics is one of the most exciting, developing research fields in ultra-fast dynamics, but what actually is it? Attosecond physics uses extremely short pulses of light to investigate how a dynamic system evolves over a very short period of time. One way to think about this technology is to first consider a series of images captured by the British photographer Edward Mybridge. In the 1870s, he was able to capture the motion of a horse at very short intervals using tripwires to show that a galloping horse can have all four legs off the ground at the same time. He used snapshot images to observe something that was too fast to see with the naked eye, and a similar idea is employed for attosecond physics, but on a much, much shorter timescale, where the horses are replaced by fast-moving electrons and attosecond pulses become our camera to view their motion. This video will tell you a bit about the evolution towards attosecond physics, what it is, how we create attosecond pulses, and finally, we will discuss some applications of this technology. Three distinct technological breakthroughs over the last 80 years have paved the way for the development of modern day attosecond physics. In the 1940s, the development of microwave electronics allowed imaging down to picosecond speeds. This technology utilised transistors to produce high-speed bursts of microwave energy known as electrical transients. In the 1960s, a new technology called ultra-fast optics was born. This eventually allowed femtosecond imaging to become a reality towards the end of the 20th century. One such method to develop a femtosecond pulse is by using a care lens. This type of optical material isolates the high intensity portion of a pulse by diffracting only the high intensity light through a small aperture. At the start of the 21st century, a new technology called light wave electronics allowed the development of attosecond pulses. This technology will be explored in detail in the remainder of this video. Electrons move incredibly fast, so fast we need to measure their motion over a period of attoseconds. To clarify, one attosecond is a billion billion times smaller than one second. That is roughly what one second is compared to the age of the universe. To get to this level of precision in time is incredibly difficult. Firstly, let's specify what parameters we expect of an attosecond light pulse. Setting the pulse length equal to the period we see that the outgoing photons would have to lie in the extreme ultraviolet to X-ray region. While it is feasible to produce such rays with the techniques known from the femtosecond measurements, the probability of two photon absorption in this part of the optical spectrum is severely reduced. In order to achieve appropriate intensities, large-scale lasers, typically free electron lasers, have to be employed but this is obviously not suitable for conventional laboratory work. The more convenient approach lies in modifying the frequency of the incoming near-infrared light to generate a higher frequency pulse. In principle, this corresponds to somehow converting a large number of low-energy photons into one photon that ideally carries the sum of all their energies. In reality, this cannot be done directly so we need an intermediate particle which could perform this addition. It turns out that shining a beam of near-infrared light into a gas of certain atoms will do just that. To understand what's happening, let's look at a single atom under the so-called single active electron approximation. The incoming beam's electric field will modify the potential of the electron just enough that quantum tunnelling may take place. The atom is now ionised, and the electron in a free state. Because of its charge, the electron will be pushed away from the atom by the external electric field until its sign changes. Consequently, the electron will eventually turn back and likely re-collide with its parent atom. In theory, four events can now occur. The first possibility is that the re-collision kicks out another electron, while the original one takes its place. Another option is that the re-collision initiates non-sequential double ionisation. Thirdly, 
the electron could be absorbed and cause internal excitation. And the last option is that the electron is absorbed by the parent atom and the electron releases its energy in the form of a single photon. With this fourth eventuality, our attosecond pulse is born. Finally, how do we ensure that there is exactly one pulse released per atom? This control is referred to as gating, and two gating options will be discussed here. Firstly, we can use a single cycle femtosecond pulse, which will then correspond to one attosecond pulse being released. Since the external electric field is not strong enough to allow for tunneling apart from that one cycle. Secondly, the incoming pulse could be generated with a time-dependent polarization so that the tails are elliptically polarized, leaving only one cycle in the center that is linearly polarized. This approach uses the fact that elliptically polarized light will accelerate the electron away from and thus miss the parent atom, so no attosecond pulse is generated by the tails. The linearly polarized center, on the other hand, does lead to electron recollision and so generates an attosecond pulse as explained earlier. One application of this technology lies in modern computing. Processing speed is fundamentally limited by how fast semiconductor transistors can switch on and off or rather between a 1 or a 0 state. Each time they switch state, some electricity from the applied current leaks, leading to heating of the transistors. The current flowing in a semiconductor increases with temperature, and so the faster it switches, the more heat it generates, eventually leading to a breakdown of the components and circuit. This limits the switching speed for a conventional transistor to the gigahertz range, but use of attosecond pulses could allow switching speeds from 1,000 to up to 100,000 times faster than this. Similar to how an electric field was used to accelerate electrons to generate the attosecond pulse, this concept uses the attosecond pulses themselves to drive electrons in a material between two electrodes. Experiments carried out to test this idea have used a circuit consisting of two gold electrodes on a dielectric surface in this case silicon dioxide, because dielectrics offer much faster responses to electric fields than either semiconductors or metals. When strong optical fields are shone on silicon dioxide, electrons can be promoted from the valence band to the well-separated conduction band, allowing the generation of current. Two consecutive attosecond pulses are generated with a carrier envelope phase difference of pi. A beam splitter then separates the pulses into two pathways, similar to a Michelson interferometer, and the polarization of one pulse is rotated by 90 degrees. When they're brought back together, the first pulse that irradiates the junction is called the injection field. This pulse stimulates the release of charge carriers, but does not drive them between the electrodes due to its vertical polarization. The second pulse, called the driving field, is polarised orthogonal to the first and so causes the electrons released by the first pulse to flow between the electrodes, thus generating a measurable current. An important finding from these experiments was that the energy transferred from the pulse to the electrons was almost completely returned to the light field after driving the charge carriers. This is significant as it removes the problem of energy leakage and heating which limited the speed of semiconductor transistors. This ability to switch the conductivity and consequently the current on and off at timescales shorter than one femtosecond could lead to huge advances in ultrafast electronics where processing speeds are pushed into the terahertz range. Unfortunately this technology is still in its infancy as large experimental setups are needed to produce and modify the pulses, so it may be many years until this technology finds its way into your desktop computer.
Another application of attosecond physics is the direct observation of electronic motion in real time. A paper published in late 2021 demonstrated that it was possible to observe the oscillation of electronic density between the HOMO and LUMO of the organic molecule PTCDA. They used the scanning tunneling microscope, or STM, to image the distribution of electrons in molecules using quantum tunneling. An STM gives fantastic spatial resolution, but offers relatively poor temporal resolution. This means that although electron density can be accurately mapped, the evolution of electron density over time is not directly observed and must instead be heavily inferred using data from indirect measurements such as absorption or emission spectra. By integrating ultra-short attosecond pulses with an STM, the desired space-time resolution to both directly visualise electrons and their motion can be obtained. An initial laser pulse is first used to stimulate oscillations between the HOMO and LUMO of PTCDA. A second pulse can then be used to image the distribution of electron density. The delay between the first and second pulse was then stepped in 400 attosecond intervals to show that by changing the pulse delay, the location of electron density was seen to change over time. The results showed that the electron density oscillates between the HOMO and LUMO roughly every 1.4 femtoseconds. This new capability to image electronic motion in molecules may allow us to better understand chemical transformations which are dominated by electron transfer. As you have heard over the course of this video, attosecond physics is a very exciting developing field of research which has a vast range of potential applications that could influence our lives in the future. We hope you have enjoyed this video and have learnt something new. Thank you for watching.